high up in the central Balkan mountains of Bulgaria, is a structure that is literally out of this world. Through the cold, swirling mist, a strange curved concrete surface emerges, punctuated by oblong openings. An amazing structure that is a little bit mysterious, I think I'd say. It reminds me of something out of a 1970s sci-fi film. Eerie light and haze pierce the 197 feet wide decaying copper that covers this abandoned 22,550 ton structure. It looks like a UFO or a flying saucer with a, a concrete spire going above it. A 230 feet high sheer sided tower punctuates the concrete disc. But what on earth was it used for? If you told me it was control center for uh, nuclear missiles, I'd believe you. If you told me it was some paganist cult worship center, I'd believe you. It's confusing. What is this extraordinary complex? And why is it here, abandoned 4,600 feet up in the central Balkan mountains? The answer lies behind the Iron Curtain of the 1970s. Bulgaria is the Soviet Union's most loyal follower, thanks to the country's communist dictator, Todor Zhivkov. To persuade his people that the communist cause is part of Bulgarian history, Zhivkov needs a unifying project on a grand scale that will win their hearts and minds. And its seemingly remote location is vital to its success. The location is important to Bulgarians because it's on the site of a 19th century battle between Bulgarian rebels, which became the Communist Party, and the forces of the Ottoman Empire. This bizarre, crumbling shell of a building is the striking Baslutza Monument. Today, it lies abandoned on a mountaintop. Bulgarian communist dictator Todor Zhivkov hopes that this structure will ignite nationalistic spirit and unite his people under the USSR communist banner. First impressions when you see the monument are sort of bewilderment. When you see monuments, there's classical shapes. This is not classical anyway. And so it's strikingly strange. For me, Buzludza pretty much exemplifies the methods communism used to keep people under the thumb and to, to exert the power over the people through their brutalistic and oppressive architecture. The project begins on January 23rd, 1974. However, creating such a massive structure on top of this inhospitable mountain range is no easy task. Constructing anything of large size in a remote area is challenging. And I think it was sort of classical socialist will that decided, you know, we're gonna build this building right here and no matter what it takes, we're gonna cart all this material up this mountain. We're gonna dynamite the top off the mountain and this is what we're gonna do and they did it. Over 500,000 cubic feet of rock is blasted away to level the top of the mountain, dropping its height by an incredible 30 feet. At such high altitude, the progress of construction is at the mercy of the elements. The workers battle heavy snowfall, high winds, and enveloping mists. They work around the clock to achieve the build in the narrow weather window from May to September. With such a demanding schedule, a constant supply of materials is vital. Now this thing's made out of concrete, so you need to get the aggregates up there, you need to get the wet concrete up there, you need to mix it up, make sure that it's all you know, properly molded together. You need to get the formwork up there so that you can actually shape the concrete. It's really a big logistical challenge.
Despite the challenges, 70,000 tons of concrete and 3,000 tons of steel are used to construct the monument. At its core is a Y-shaped base that takes the whole vertical load of the unique flying saucer. Centered around a simple interior structure, the futuristic outer shell poses more of a problem. The design of the monument was a great challenge for the engineering in the 70s. The shape and the concrete was calculated by computers in Moscow. When you're trying to make something as curved and as sinuous as this structure that we're looking at here, then you need to think about, well, how am I actually going to achieve that? So it's a really interesting challenge for engineers, especially in that era, to create these really smooth curves against which they then want to pour the concrete. An impressive 30 tonnes of copper cladding covers the roof of the saucer, which can be heated to melt heavy snowfall preventing the roof from collapse. One of the biggest challenges that the engineers would have had to consider in designing this is the amount of snow that the roof would need to resist. So having the shallow dome shape is actually a fairly good shape because it will allow some snow to kind of move its way off and to flow off. The most outstanding element of this construction is the tower that soars from the mountaintop towards the sky. Its summit takes the load of two 39 feet high red glass stars, each weighing a colossal 3.5 tons. They were the biggest illuminated stars in the world. They could be seen from hundreds of kilometers away by good weather. No expense is spared on the lavish interior of the structure. From the outside, you see this brutalist concrete version of the Millennium Falcon. But on the inside, the feeling's quite different. They used 35 tons of mosaic and stained glass to decorate the inside to give it the atmosphere that they want. The mosaics are not just for decorative purposes. Every element within the monument must be a reminder of the communist cause. From the one side could be seen the faces of Lenin, Marx and Engels, and from the other side, the Bulgarian communist leaders. A 5,490 square feet mosaic of the sickle and hammer crowns the center of this monumental achievement. It takes seven years, 6,000 volunteers, and $35 million in today's money to construct Buzluza. The grand opening on August 23rd, 1981 is attended by the world's top communist leaders. The site is immediately glorified throughout the communist world as a beacon of power. <laughs>